Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you. There's reason to be optimistic right now. The forecast of the state budget. Students continue to speak out about sexual violence on campus. The latest complaints about LSU. I do want this word to get out. I want it to save as many lives as possible. A grandmother's plea for more vaccinations. Stan at all was the first one to come to this area and put a station. We didn't have any other stations up here. How SO Standard Oil built up a Baton Rouge community. Hi, I'm Kara St. Cyr. And I'm Andre Morrow. Right now on SWI, COVID cases and hospitalizations continue to trend downward. Currently, 923 new cases have been recorded and 354 people have been hospitalized. The Louisiana Department of Health reports the majority of COVID cases continues to be among the unvaccinated. Vaccination rates, though, continue to slowly increase. State officials are still pushing for more people to get their shots before flu season really picks up. Louisiana's Shot for 100 campaign is still going strong. Anyone who hasn't received their first dose is eligible to win $100 if they sign up to participate. The clock is ticking on this campaign. It ends October 30th. And now to other news making headlines across the state. AT&T says it will put some of its fiber optic infrastructure in southeast Louisiana underground to avoid future hurricane outages. The fury of Hurricane Ida caused a number of cuts to key fiber optic lines. The plan to bury equipment that had been on power poles in the region will focus on Jefferson, Lafouche, Orleans, St. Charles, St. James, and Terrebonne parishes. A new mediation program could help homeowners and insurance companies haggling over damage claims from Ida. Insurance Commissioner Jim Donnellan detailed the program, which uses a flat fee of $600 paid by either party to try and intervene. The state's top higher education board is asking for a nearly $220 million budget increase next year. The money to be used to boost the number of people getting degrees and professional certifications beyond high school. If approved, it would mean a budget increase of 20 percent. Grambling State is offering counseling to students and staff after two deadly shootings on campus last week. The shootings on October 13th and 17th left two dead and 10 wounded. Louisiana State Police are investigating. This 60-foot alligator-themed float promoting Louisiana will debut during the 95th annual Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. Louisiana officials are spending almost $1.4 million to feature the float for the next three years. Surplus and Louisiana are words that often are not seen together, but that is the case right now. The Commissioner of Administration, Jay Darden, is here with us, optimistic as a matter of fact. And first of all, let me say, did you ever think at this point in time we would be with a $1 billion surplus and another $1 billion surplus of funds? Well, there's, there's reason to be optimistic right now. I think we, we've turned the corner after the pandemic and things are much better and have proven to be much better uh, during the course of the past year. No, I didn't think we would be at a point where we'd have a, a billion dollar uh, surplus in our state generated revenue, nor did we have any uh, expectation that we'd have this much federal money pouring into the state. The state generated revenue performed better, so it was forecast lower, but you got better uh, performance on that end, so that's why the numbers were higher. Well, that, that's right. I mean, when the pandemic hit, REC met and properly 
pretty dramatically lowered yeah. the forecast because we didn't know the duration of the pandemic. We didn't know what impact it would have. I don't think anybody would have expected it to last as long as it has, but we were very conservative in saying we don't think the economy is going to do well during this pandemic. And in fact, the economy did better than that forecast. And that's the reason why we have uh, such a large number of, of surplus dollars. Now, a significant amount of that billion dollars is dedicated and is going to go already. Some of it has gone into particular funds. It's protected also and structured in such a way that things can't be just spent all at once. Well, that's right. And it can't be used for operating expenses or for recurring expenses. So uh, a portion of the surplus this year went into the Revenue Stabilization Fund, a new fund that the legislature created and the people put in the Constitution, socks away about 200 million of that surplus into a fund that really can't be touched, absent two-thirds vote of the legislature or, or some extended period of time. And then uh, there's some other dedicated funds within that billion dollars that flow directly to specific dedications. Bottom line, at the end of the day, we're going to have about $525 million or so that will be truly surplus to be dealt with by the legislature in next year's session. But there's a limitation on how that money is spent as well. Right. Now, we've talked about pandemic. It's been a different animal than hurricane disasters. But we've had hurricanes also. And we're familiar with the money that can come in after that to rebuild and get back on our feet. Uh, but so you have a one-two kind of punch of this uh, wave of, of calamity uh, type of act activities happening. Yeah, that's right. And, and it was indeed a punch when you when you add the, the damage from Ida to the to the pandemic and how it impacted the economy and how it affected the state and Laura overlay that, Laura right. last year on yeah. the different part of the state it's been a, a very difficult year obviously for the state um, the aftermath of those storms and the aftermath and we hope it's the aftermath of the pandemic right. um, means dollars are flowing into the state from the federal government and that's usually what happens after a disaster be it a natural disaster like a hurricane or this never before experienced yes. nationwide pandemic where you don't just see money flowing into a state that's been victimized by a natural disaster. You see every state and territory in America getting unprecedented amounts of money. Now, infrastructure, which is left undone for years and years in maintenance and in uh, rehab and in rebuilding, can be a beneficiary of this. It, it will be the primary beneficiary if, if we have our way. I mean, the, the governor will be recommending to the legislature that that 400 and some odd million dollar surplus be divided into three pots. And this is what we've recommended every time we've had a surplus. And we have had surpluses the past couple of years. It gives us a chance to invest in uh, infrastructure within the state, roads and bridges, highways, ports, uh, in also in one-time expenditures for deferred maintenance mm -hmm. on state buildings, particularly on universities and a portion of it for coastal projects. So those are the three pots that we will recommend the money be divided into. There's a watchdog group that has mentioned the unfunded pensions that in the past has raised concerns in Louisiana, but you're saying not so at this time. Well, we're, we're on a path to take care of our unfunded accrued liability, and the people of this state properly have directed that when you have a surplus, a certain percentage goes to two things. 25%, a minimum, must go into the rainy day fund, which will happen with this surplus dollars and 10 percent of it has to go to the unfunded accrued liability on our retirement systems that um, that'll help us make progress toward paying down that obligation. It's got to be staggering for you to look at how it's gone from where it could have been to where it is now and as you said there's optimism. Well there's been tremendous progress I mean remember when Governor Edwards first took office on um, the first yeah. term we're talking about a two billion dollar problem that we were able to dig out of the legislature properly responded to restore some sources of revenue and the economy has performed well, better than expected in each of these past couple of years. Couple that with the largesse coming from the federal government and we have a perhaps a once in a lifetime chance to make some significant investments sure. in the infrastructure of Louisiana. And we say this as we know so many people in our state, in the southwest part of the state and the southeast part of the state continue and will continue to suffer for years from the hurricanes. Well, that's right. And, and it's, so. it's, it's always a tragedy. And the, the unfortunate uh, story for Louisiana is we're used to this. We're, and it'll happen again. We, yeah. That's right. It'll happen again. And we know how to deal with it. That doesn't make it any easier, make it any better for those who are victimized. But uh, we've got a great Department of Emergency Management who works well with agencies across the state. Um, when a crisis strikes, we react and we respond, and resiliency is always the term that's used. We bounce back as Louisianians, and, and that's going to always happen. Well, it's, it's good that we're in the place we're in right now, and uh, you're in the position to look over this. Jay, thank you so much. Thanks, I Andre. Your time. Glad to be with you.
This week, hundreds of students protested LSU's failure to investigate the sexual misconduct of a former grad student who fled to his home country of France. There is a rape charge pending against him and at least six other allegations. I talked with leaders of STAR, sexual trauma awareness and response about this, about Coach O, and also their latest legislative scorecard. Students continue to speak out about sexual violence on campus. Um, we definitely view this as something that is a long process. So I know that almost a year ago, the USA Today article came out about LSU's mishandling of sexual misconduct. Um, and I think that many people in the community expected it to go away pretty quickly after they enlisted Hush Blackwell to do the um, audit on their practices, as well as LSU implementing a lot of new initiatives. Um, I think that our work with LSU has shown that they have taken all of this to heart and they have made significant improvements in the way they handle sexual misconduct. Uh, but the truth is that people continue to experience sexual assault on campus. And of course, there are students that have been there before the past year when these changes were made that still have stories to tell. Is that what we're seeing in this particular case with this grad student who, again, has gone back to France and I don't know what the situation of having him come back here to face the situation, how that would play out. My fear is that because you're going to see more stories coming out, because not all of those stories about things that happened in the past or in the Hush Blackwell report, you're going to occasionally see more and more stories come out. And I think that that sort of hinders the progress because although it happened in the past, when people distrust that they've actually been transparent about everything, it sort of reopens wounds that are still in the middle of healing. So I think that we kind of need to get everything on the table. There are, as Rachel had said, more stories that really need to come out and be dealt with. But until they are very transparent about all that they've done in the past or not done in the past, the wounds are not gonna, are not gonna heal. There's no lack of things going on on the LSU campus then right now still. And one of those, of course, is the latest with Coach Ed Ogeron and uh, his uh, ouster and apparently going to get this large sum of money, the, the buyout. However, that hinges on some legal matters that still could be in play. There's some lawsuits that are in place right now that through the discovery process, there will be more information obtained. Um, I think that right now, maybe there is things that are being uncovered through the discovery process that is not out in the public yet, that there is some, some level of mitigation we don't know. Um, I suspect that there is more information out there. And to me, I am at that point where LSU, you know, I went there for undergrad and I feel like there would be a lot more trust and, and sort of faith in the school if they just came, came clean, to be honest, worked with survivors, said, you know, we know we caused harm and looked into possibilities for settlements and to honestly admit their wrongdoing. And I think that that would go a long way with trust in the community and we just unfortunately don't see that happening, especially when there continues to be this environment or belief that they have to reduce risk and liability right now. Let's discuss the legislative scorecard, which uh, you guys have um, released that also just recently. Our legislature has become very partisan. And there are times when people really try to, uh, I, I guess you could say, make points political points on things that don't need, you know, it's it's overwhelmingly supported by um, legislators, no matter what their party, but because of sort of these games that are played, um, there were some votes that were made that realistically could have killed some of our bills. So we decided to grade the procedural mechanisms that legislators voted on in order to make these political points rather than just the actual legislation. So you'll see a little, some different things in our, our scorecard that we have not really done before, but we really wanted to highlight what legislators stand with survivors no matter what, and do not put political party or political games in front of, you know, basically the votes that would 
lend us to those uh, bills being passed. Is there a place where people can go to look at that scorecard to, to see what the numbers are or if that's what it is? If you visit our website, star.ngo, there is a link on the homepage. You can also uh, find it through our Instagram account or Facebook account, which our handle is at Star Advocates. The number of COVID cases may be trending downward, but for Dawn Bear, the pandemic is far from over. After losing her 24-year-old pregnant granddaughter to the virus, Bear is asking everyone to get the vaccine. Louisiana's COVID hospitalizations are dipping, but the threat of the virus is still very real. Dawn Bear lost someone very special to it. I consider her my adopted daughter. I practically um, raised her since she was six. She had gotten a uh, well, not gotten, but she was expecting a baby this year. Uh, she had a, a baby shower and, um, and she caught the Delta variant at the baby shower. The woman Bear calls her adoptive daughter was actually gonna be her grandchild by way of marriage. But within a week of the baby shower, 15 unvaccinated family members and friends caught the virus. That's when Bear's grandchild, who she asked not to be named, started to feel the symptoms of COVID build in her lungs. She got the shortness of breath and the coughing fits. These symptoms were enough to bring her to the hospital, but not enough to keep her there. Within that time of testing positive, she had gone to a hospital. Uh, they had given her some fluids, sent her home. And the next week she had gotten worse, had trouble breathing, went into the hospital and uh, Within, I'd say, three or four days, uh, she was placed on a ventilator. And she had delivered the baby, uh, which is fine. But we literally went through an emotional roller coaster. For 14 days, Bear's grandchild struggled to breathe under ventilator tubes. It was an emotional roller coaster for her family because at one point, it seemed like she would get better. But on the 15th day of being in the hospital, her body couldn't handle the complications anymore and she died on August 21st. She was 24 years old with no underlying health conditions. Close to the end of her life, doctors were able to deliver her healthy baby boy, which is the only thing that gives Bear something to look forward to now that her grandchild is gone. It was totally traumatic. And the whole 14 days that she was on it was, like I said, just an emotional roller coaster that I'll never forget, never. And it's, it was like the worst time in my life, actually, dealing with something, you know, watching someone be on a ventilator and, and just hoping and praying, you know, that they would survive. She was a um, truly wonderful person, personable. Um, anyone would like her. She was a beautiful person within and outside. Yes, she was. And vibrant, you know, she was very vibrant. What happened to Bear's grandchild is hardly a new story. In the U.S., more than 128,000 pregnant people have been diagnosed with COVID. Of that number, 180 have died. In September, the CDC wrote that people who are pregnant have a higher risk of being admitted into hospitals and a 70% increased risk of death. Even if they aren't hospitalized, infected people still have a high chance of having a stillbirth or a premature baby. Bear says her grandchild didn't know all of the risks. Instead, her focus was on how the vaccine would affect her child. What I understand, she had done a lot of research and, uh, and in the beginning of her pregnancy, it was not recommended that she have the vaccine. So she had done her research and um, came to the conclusion that it was not a good idea. It was not something that was would protect her or the baby. So that's why she did not have the vaccine. The vaccine had not been tested on pregnant people during the initial trials. There wasn't a lot of data to go on. So Bear's grandchild decided not to get it. A medical professional, you know, she would have gotten maybe some advice from them, you know, as far as maybe, you know, you should consider it because we have statistics, you know, basically that show that it is safe. Aber hopes the story of what happened to her family will inspire others to get the vaccine. Currently in the U.S., 
about two-thirds of pregnant people have gotten their shots. But Abair says that number isn't high enough. I do want this word to get out. I want it to save as many lives as possible. Abair says one of her biggest regrets about the situation was not asking her granddaughter to talk with a doctor. So if you or someone you love is on the fence about getting the vaccine, make sure you talk it over with the physician and ask them your questions. Not long ago, filling up a gas tank would have been dangerous for African Americans in Louisiana. But in Scotlandville, there was one place you could trust, Esso Standard Oil, or ExxonMobil, as we call it today. On this episode of Safe Haven, we're driving you to North Baton Rouge to meet one man who remembers a time when the Green Book was the safest option for travel. It's hard to believe if I were to travel just 70 years ago, this little guide could potentially save my life. I'm Kara St. Cyr, and this is Safe Haven, Louisiana's Green Book. Getting gas is something we likely all take for granted. It's an easy, mundane task, but in the 1950s, that wasn't the case for everyone. If a black person went to the wrong gas station while traveling, it could lead to a humiliating incident, or worse. In the 1950s in the Deep South, lynching was still a threat. In Louisiana alone, 549 lynchings were reported from 1877 to 1950. For African Americans just passing through, stops for bathroom breaks or car service had to be carefully planned. Esso service stations, or as we call it today, ExxonMobil, were places African Americans could trust. Dalton Honoré still remembers those days. Hey, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? My name is Kara. We're on our way to what's left of Horatio's Esso Station Number no. 2 in Scotlandville, Louisiana which is a historic town north of Baton Rouge that's home to Southern University. It was once the largest majority black town in Louisiana, and Esso Standard Oil was partly the reason for that. It's a special company for Scotlandville because it was one of the few businesses that would hire black people in all positions. We didn't have anything else. Uh, Standard Oil was the first one to come to this area and put a station. We didn't have any other stations up here. But if you had a job at Standard Oil and all you was was basically a laborer there. You had one of the best jobs you could have. Blacks was a great part of building that refinery down there. And they, I talked to some of my ancestors during the time they were building that station because my, my family had been, been here in this community since, since late 20s. In the time of Jim Crow, when blacks couldn't even use the same water fountain as whites, Esso hired black gas attendants, managers, and even franchise owners. The company even distributed copies of the Green Book, which ended up being advantageous to a man named Horatio Thompson. He was the first black man to own an Esso franchise in the South, and he opened it in Dalton's neighborhood. Service stations provided more than just gas for travelers. You could get your car repaired, buy food, even appliances. But most importantly, they provided bathrooms. When we went, as blacks, went to a gas station, and we got some females traveling with us. First thing we'd do is ask uh, whether you got a bathroom. And we've been told them many times there was no bathroom. So if, if you could make it to another gasoline station, you'd try. You'd sometimes have to go to two or three before somebody would say, yeah, we got one on the back. Other than that, you couldn't go to the bathroom. The farther west you went, the restrictions lightened up a lot. Horatio's Esso station quickly made him a leader in the community. But what really solidified his status was his station's participation in the Baton Rouge bus boycott in 1953. So everybody who had a car, black in Baton Rouge, was buying gasoline for Horatio Thompson because he was selling it below the cost of these independent stations or what have you, and sold it to the patrons who participated in the boycott with the automobile, sold it to them at cost. All they had to do was put a sign in their window letting Horatio know they were carpoolers. Sometimes he'd even give that gas away for free. He lost thousands of dollars in profit that year, but still managed to become the first black millionaire in Baton Rouge. The largest investment anybody put in this community at the time was Horatio Thompson. Horatio built up a community struggling under the weight of racism. His image is painted on the service shop because even though the station isn't there, his legacy remains. ExxonMobil Baton Rouge is proud to support Safe Haven, Louisiana's Green Book.
For more than 100 years, ExxonMobil has made a commitment to workforce diversity and the belief that reflecting on historic race relations is key to shaping a better future. We'll be showing one more episode of Safe Haven on the state we're in, but we've got four more episodes that we put together for the series. You can watch those on our YouTube page. The link is right there on your screen. We are thrilled to tell you the names of the LPB 2022 Louisiana Legends. The six honorees are Arthur Favre, CEO and founder of Performance Contractors, Dr. Sandra Yancey McGuire, retired assistant vice chancellor and emerita professor of chemistry at LSU, Dr. Stephen McGuire, Emeritus Professor of Physics at Southern University and A&M. Coach Paul Maneri, retired LSU baseball coach, coach of the 2009 National Champs. Valson Marmillion, founder of Marmillion and & Company and former managing director of America's Wetland Foundation. And Thomas Whitehead, expert and preservationist of the Clementine Hunter Collection. They will be honored next April 28th. That's going to be at the Old State Capitol at the Friends of LPB Gala here in Baton Rouge. Louisiana legends have been honored annually since 1990. Also, the final episode of the first season of Ziggy is finally online. If you haven't checked it out, here's your chance. You can find the entire first season on the LPB YouTube page. Here's a sneak peek of what you will see. I keep thinking how all these art forms like painting, music, dance are so different yet they're all still interesting ways of filling up space. Way to put it all together, Zig. Now turn up the music, Nick Fitz. I want to feel it in my bones. Everybody get up, man. We'll also be airing an hour-long special broadcast on Sunday, October 24th. Ziggy will air from 6 to 6.30 p.m. And It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown, will air from 7 to 7.30 p.m. And everyone, that is our show for this week. Remember, you can watch anything LPB anytime, wherever you are, with our LPB app. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows, as well as other Louisiana programs you've come to enjoy over the years. And please, like us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. For everyone here at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Andre Mora. And I'm Kara Sinks here. Until next time, that's the state we're at. Entergy is proud to support programming on LPB and greener practices that preserve Louisiana. The goal of our environmental and sustainability initiatives really is to ensure that our kids and future generations can be left with a cleaner planet. Additional support provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation and the Ziegler Art Museum located in Jennings City Hall. The museum focuses on emerging Louisiana artists and is an historical and cultural center for Southwest Louisiana. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting with support from viewers like you.